Center. And he put together a whole set of practices for people with chronic pain who were basically dumped by their MDs because they tried meds, prosthetics, surgery, etc. These people were not responding to treatment. So he put together something for them. And of course, with chronic pain comes substance use, chronic emotional pain. It's all linked together. This has three main components. It's a hodgepodge. Formal meditation practice, like breath focus, like we did a moment ago. Body scan, where you actually are scanning your body for sensation and learning how to, to train your attention. Shifting attention to different sensory modalities and loving kindness. Informal meditation practice. So even right this moment, you don't have to change your body posture at all. Just shift for, the, for one breath, one inhalation, exhalation. Just shift your attention, even with your eyes open, to your own breath. I call those meaningful pauses. Throughout the day, four, five, six, seven, eight times, when you're calm, when you're anxious, when nothing's going on, when a lot's going on, see if you can actually develop the muscle, the habit, of shifting your attention back to your own breath, even for one cycle. It has very clear effects. And then this, this program also included Hatha Yoga. How many people here do regular yoga practice? Ooh, okay. How many people here are not from California? <laughs> Don't answer that. Um, if you want to do one thing to prolong your well-being, reduce your anxiety, and maintain physical and mental flexibility until you're 80, 90, 100, yoga. Yoga is incredibly uh, helpful. So you can see this MBSR program is what's currently has been accepted by the medical establishment and almost all companies. So Google teaches this several times a week. It's an, it's an eight-week program. We're, we're doing, we just got big grants to study its effects on anxiety disorders, people with chronic pain, et cetera. Um, there are many kinds of meditation practices. Simply put, some of them are about concentration, trying to focus to actually train your attention. There are many forms. Others are analytic or linguistic reasoning, where you actually use logic in the context of a guided meditation to understand fear, insecurity, self-doubt, anger, love. You actually think through these meditation practices. So they're linguistic or conceptual contemplations. All of those are preliminary to establish qualities in the mind to do the real work, which is the latter one. This is the only one that really, really, really matters. Everything else is, is preparatory which is meditation on emptiness, or shunyata in Sanskrit. And that's the actual conceptual to non-conceptual antidote to suffering, confusion, angst. All these other kinds of practices are all have to, if they don't lead to this, then it doesn't do too much. So there's a whole developmental trajectory. In the same way that we go from preschool to PhD, in the monasteries, in meditation centers throughout the world, there's an actual developmental trajectory of training the mind to get more and more free of all the sources of confusion, doubt, insecurity, pain, jealousy, etc. Many different ways to define mindfulness. Uh, it actually comes from the Sanskrit uh, smriti, which means to remember. John Kabat-Zinn, who's pictured here, he has defined it in the following way. Paying attention in a particular way on purpose, intentionally, in the present moment, not tripping out about the future that hasn't happened yet, the past that already occurred, but staying in the present. And if we had a little meter, uh, I would guess that we only spend about 5% of our waking hours in the present, or mostly, and you can think about your own research laboratory, which is this. How much of the time are you worried about something that has not happened yet, or worried about things that have already happened? And how much of your mind or attention is really there and not here? And for Westerners, this last part is the, the most difficult. Training your mind in these practices in a non-judgmental, non-self-deprecating, non-self-critical manner. We here in the West, less so for Asians, more so for uh, people who are acculturated to this culture, self-critical, self-doubt, low self-esteem. That's uh, endemic. 
process model, you set an intention that you're going to try to do these practices, uh, whether in the workplace or in the hospital or in your own home, now they're doing it, or at school, to, to reduce your stress, to increase your well-being. Maybe you have anxiety, depression, insomnia, eating disorders, and you want to reduce. You could, it's been used for everything. You follow the breath, you pick an object. It can also be sensation on the skin or sound or music. You try to train your attention in these two ways that we talked about, att attentional focus and then this open monitoring where there's no specific object. You're simply noticing from moment to moment what is actually moving through your awareness. You will become distracted and in that moment you can either, your attention might be spinning on ruminating on things, worrying, fantasizing, but the key thing is to bring your attention back, back back and you literally develop the muscle of training your attention. And you try to do this in a non-judgmental, kind, tender manner. Not beating ourselves up. Um, <clears throat> some mechanisms of this particular one type of meditation training. So some of the evidence suggests that it actually enhances different aspects of emotion regulation. The ability to volitionally regulate your emotion willfully by using different strategies. Attention regulation, to, be, to know when your mind is distracted and to bring it back. And then probably underlying both of those is self-focused processing. How you view yourself, how you relate to yourself, how you treat yourself. And I'll show you some brain data for this as well. <clears throat> Very simple brain model, neural model in the presence of a stimulus, a trigger. And it, the trigger can be external or internal. It can be real or it can be imagined. The brain has been developed in human animals, us, to, to shift within milliseconds in parts of the brain that are called, for lack of a better term, the limbic regions that detect what is salient, could induce an emotional shift, and it sends a bottom-up signal to other parts of the brain, other brain systems, to help. So in blue here is cognitive and attention regulation. When that is working well, it exerts top-down regulation to modify specific aspects of your ongoing affective or emotional state. When this is not working well, exaggerated or hyper-emotional reactivity, I'm sure we all have friends who we know are hyper-emotional, and or people who are really not skillful at down-regulating their emotions. This is what leads to depression, anxiety, suicide, eating disorders, substance use, you name it. So this is all happening in our own brains. And it is modifiable, trainable. Can mo you can actually do practices to change how these different brain systems are communicating. What's unique in human animals, us, are, is the, the two little circles in yellow and green. Language, how we think and speak to ourselves in our own mind. For example, just notice, notice reactivity to this. I'll say some statements. I'm not OK the way I am. I'm not good enough. I'm never going to be the, the best child to my parents. I'm, never gonna, I'm always going to be lonely. I'm never going to be successful. If you have those thoughts ringing in your head, that totally sucks. Another way is to say, I'm OK the way I am, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The way that we speak to ourselves totally influences. It's happening right here in the brain. I know the exact circuit. If you give me a knife, I know exactly where to cut it out. It wouldn't be too much fun to not be able to have used language. But the way that we speak to ourselves influences. The other part is the self-view. And then we're going to do a practice in a moment. And there's a fantastic, clear, self-conceptual network that we can see with brain imaging, with fMRI. So all of these different brain systems are constantly working together to either maintain a certain emotional balance or throw us off balance. The more that each of us individually knows what it's like to be in that optimal attentional state, we will become much more intimately aware and of um, ourselves and the ability to then make little adjustments to feel OK. And that will influence everyone else who comes into contact with you. So it's not only for your own benefit. It's for the benefit of everyone who interacts with you. Because our brains, even when we're not consciously aware, we're constantly picking up 
other people's emotional states. That's called emotional contagion. That's one of the most insidious things that happens on teams in the workplace. You can have 10 great, brilliant people. One person is emotionally off. The other nine brains are picking up those signals and falling apart. I see it all the time at Google when I do coaching there. So this is one of the tools that we use, fMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Really amazing tool. The physics behind it are beautiful. It basically allows us to go under the skull and actually let the brain speak for itself, not mediated through language. We can actually see signals in the brain that help us understand what people are attending to, thinking, whether they're emotional, whether they're regulating or not. So there are many kinds of brain, many different methods or technologies for analyzing brain uh, signals. This is just a few of them. There's no one that's optimal. They all have pros and cons. And there are many more tools that are being made available. But I happen to use EEG and fMRI right now. So here's a one-page primer, primer on how we go do an fMRI experiment. You're lying down in that tube. It's dark. You're completely still. And then I ping you with your own negative beliefs, your own beliefs, for example. I'm not OK the way I am. Nobody likes me. For people with social anxiety, for example, that's like, ah, you know, I'm never going to be OK. I'm not OK the way I am. This sets neurons firing that then trigger circuits of neurons and different brain systems that we were talking about. Then when the neurons are, are firing, they're consuming glucose, fuel. And they send a signal, hey, bring more blood flow with oxygen, with glucose, delivered to the places where the neurons are firing. We take advantage of that. And through a lot of statistical and signal processing, we create what you've probably seen in many books and magazines, brain maps, color-coded to indicate activity in different functional neuroanatomy. And that's where the detective work begins. All, all of this was actually design and statistical analysis. Now you have to really start doing interpretation. So this is one example of how we go from a thought to brain maps. And that happens to be the, the bilateral amygdala, which is one and very important brain region in a, net, in a network of brain regions that are important for the experience of emotion. So how do we get from negative self-beliefs to psychological flexibility and freedom? Freedom from the stickiness of your own thoughts and beliefs. Well, one way is mindfulness meditation. That's one technology. There are many ways. The punchline is this. I conceptualize it as WD-40. Mindfulness meditation is just like spraying WD-40 in a sticky lock. Do you guys know what WD-40 is? Does anybody know? OK. So it's some special chemical. So if you have a car or a house key that doesn't fit into the lock because it's been filled up with dirt and grit, you spray this stuff in, it loosens everything up, and the key can go in. So WD-40 is, like, is an analogy for the effect of the mindfulness meditation. It literally loosens up the grit, the stickiness, the habits of the mind, so you can try something else out. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just move on because I want to do another practice. So <clears throat> we use different kinds of tasks. Motion regulation for negative self-beliefs, self-focused processing, your own beliefs about yourself from a positive view and a negative view. So um, for the emotion regulation task, what we normally do is we'd have people provide scripts of their own painful social anxiety situations social situations, your own negative beliefs. And we actually ask you, we test you to see how much you react to your own negative beliefs. Then we ask you to implement different strategies. Some are mindful awareness, which is just an attentional shift. Distraction, counting backwards by threes or whatever. Or cognitive reappraisal, which is actively reinterpreting the meaning of, say, a difficult situation that occurred with a roommate to make your own reactions quell. Maybe he was having a hard time. Maybe she was really sick that day. She didn't really mean to be nasty to me. He didn't really want to be an asshole. He just wasn't feeling well. It had nothing to do with me. Suddenly, my own reactivity goes down. It's not about me. That person was having a tough time. 